This video is sponsored by Boxu. Question, what do you think when you see a big pile of potatoes? Do they get you excited? I'm gonna guess probably not. All around the world, the humble potato is so common that we tend to just take it for granted. People think of it as ordinary, maybe even boring. But that has gotta be one of the biggest misunderstandings in food history. Because the tale of the potato is full of intrigue, conspiracy, revolution, and life and death struggles. I'm just gonna say it, without the potato, the modern world as we know it would not have been possible. This is the story of how a simple tuber changed the planet and all of our lives for good. So for me, growing up in Germany where potato is literally a slang term for somebody who is extremely German, it is very hard to imagine this country without its favorite vegetable. But if you paid any attention in school, I hope you're aware that the potato did indeed not originate in Europe. Actually, not even close. Its origins lie halfway around the world in South America. A few years ago, I actually traveled to Peru and Bolivia where I stopped by Lake Titicaca. High up in the Andean mountains, this is exactly the region where roughly 10,000 years ago, the Inca have begun cultivating potatoes for food. And it shows to this day. On the markets in this part of the world, you will find more potato varieties than you can count. They come in many beautiful different shapes and colors and have been a staple of local cuisines for literal millennia. Back in the day, the Inca would of course eat them fresh, but there was another much more interesting way of consuming potatoes. Remember how I said potato cultivation started high up in the mountains? People would take small potatoes potatoes and they would lay them out flat and then utilize the extreme climate with sub-zero temperatures at night and intense sunlight during the day to essentially freeze dry the tubers. The resulting product was called chuño and it would last for years, if not even decades, quite literally fueling the rise of the Inca Empire. At least until another empire showed up at the shores of America. The Spanish colonizers immediately took notice of the potato as a staple food of the new world, but they were as fascinated as they were flabbergasted. They called it the bread of the Inca and quickly figured out it was pretty good stuff. But as a plant, it was so different from fruit trees or grains that they would actually have a really hard time wrapping their head around it. And this will become very important in a second, wait for it. Unsurprisingly, it didn't take very long until sometime in the early 1500s, a few adventurous Spanish explorers brought back a barrel of the peculiar American plant to the motherland. And from there, the delicious potato quickly conquered <laughs> And from there, the delicious potato quickly conquered the hearts and stomachs of first Europe and then the rest of the world. Right? Oh no, <laughs> very wrong. So let's zoom out a little bit first. The first potatoes that arrived in Europe were quite the rarity. They would get passed around among scholars and botanists who would, you know, play around with this new world plant and study it with wonder. Because potatoes were so easy to grow, it would only take a couple of decades until you could find some geeky gardener cultivating potatoes in a corner of his backyard almost anywhere in Europe. But these pioneer gardeners, very often actually monks in a monastery, they would almost always be affiliated to some kind of local king, lord, or the church, somebody of high status. And occasionally, their high status lords would even get to eat a few potatoes. We know that because there are books with potato recipes from as early as the 1600s. But if you think that means regular people were also well on the potato train back then, well, I gotta disappoint you. With a few notable exceptions, like the south of Spain and Ireland, quite importantly, the potato was not welcome. In fact, among common people, the potato was known as the devil's apple. So, as you might guess, they weren't so crazy about it. And if you're wondering why, well, think about it. Here's this plant you've never seen before. It comes from a faraway heathen kingdom. It is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Botanically speaking, it is a nightshade. Most nightshades are toxic for humans and so are the leaves of a potato plant for that matter. Oh, and by the way, you don't grow potatoes from seeds like any other crop before it. No, they grow these ugly fat tubers, which you can like break up into chunks and then you can plant this chunk and a new plant will grow out of it, you know, complete with new tubers and all. But hey, sure, wanna make some soup? Most European peasants back in the day were skeptical at best when it came to potatoes and straight up scared of diseases or the devil in most cases. And except for a handful of very experimental monk gardeners, scholars weren't exactly fond of the potato either. This French philosopher by the name of Denis Diderot, he wrote a really important encyclopedia back in the day. He put it this way, 
No matter how you prepare it, the root is tasteless and starchy. It cannot be regarded as an enjoyable food, but it proves abundant, reasonably healthy food for men who want nothing but sustenance. What an endorsement. So in a nutshell, the potato simply had a giant PR problem. No wonder that in the beginning it was reserved for feeding animals or as nutrition for the homeless or the poorest of the poor. And it may possibly have stayed that way forever, except the potato sort of arrived at just the right time. Let me explain. So let's zoom out just a little bit once again. There's this climate phenomenon known as the Little Ice Age. I'll keep it very short for you guys. For 300 years or so, Europe was quite a bit colder than normal. The consequence of this was quite dramatic. In most years, the entire continent of Europe was actually struggling to sustain itself. There simply wasn't enough food for everyone. Famine and hunger were tragic parts of everyday life back in the day. There was a glimmer of hope though, you guessed it, the potato. No matter how weird the plant was, by the 18th century, scholars have had plenty of time to figure out that it was not just completely safe to eat, it was actually kind of a miracle crop. Coming from the Andean mountains, potatoes could be grown in really rough conditions and all you needed to plant and harvest them were your hands, no special equipment required. And after the harvest, all you needed to do was boil it in some water and that was it. No threshing, milling and baking into bread required, which was kind of a big advantage compared to grains if you think about it. The edible part of the potato is also grown underground, which actually helped to protect it from certain types of animals or plundering soldiers in times of war. But perhaps most importantly was the potato's productivity. With it, you could grow up to three times the amount of calories compared to grains on the same spot of land. But it's not just three times more food, it's actually more nutritionally balanced food. If you've ever seen The Martian, well, what a tangent. You might know that if you can only eat one food, potatoes will keep you alive the longest because they actually contain all the essential amino acids you need, blah, blah, blah. And so during the 18th century, one European ruler after the other started to slowly figure out that, hey, actually potatoes have the potential to keep my population not just healthy, but also growing. And more people means a bigger workforce and also more soldiers to win wars. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal. So all these rulers had to do was convince regular people to eat potatoes. How hard could that be? Well. <laughs> Let me introduce you to this guy, Frederick the Great, King of Prussia. That's Prussia with a P, so basically Germany. He was one of those rulers that saw massive potential in the potato. So in 1756, Frederick issues a decree called der Kartoffelbefehl, or the Potato Act, forcing all of his subjects to grow and eat this new plant. Problem solved? Ah. Not quite. In fact, nobody cared. Still not eating the devil's apple, even if the king says so. Hmm, interesting. But why is it then that if you go to the German city of Potsdam, where Frederick is buried, you will to this day find potatoes on his grave, glorifying him as the potato king, the guy who introduced Germany to its new favorite crop. Actually, there's a really interesting legend about just that. Apparently, Frederick had a plan. He first set up these massive potato farms, actually right Right here in Berlin and then he stationed ridiculous amounts of soldiers and guards around these farms. And naturally common people would notice and be like, oh my god, whatever's growing on these fields must be so damn valuable. I wonder what it is and if I could have some. But in fact, that was exactly what Frederick was hoping for. He instructed his guards to let anyone who wants to steal some potatoes steal some potatoes. It was basically a genius reverse psychology marketing move resulting in the black markets being flooded with this hot new commodity, the potato, and it only took a few decades from there until it was a staple all across the country. But if there's one thing I learned in years of researching food stories, it's that the really good ones are usually not true. <laughs> Let's uh, clean this up a little bit. So the Potato Act Frederick passed, that was definitely a thing. So I guess we can keep calling him the Potato King, even though I kind of want that title for myself. 
can I at least be like the French fry prince or something? Anyway, there's no good evidence that this guard story actually happened. In fact, there are stories just like that from all sorts of other European countries, only with a different person from that country as the mastermind. In France, for example, the marketing genius is Antoine Parmentier, who is basically France's number one potato evangelist. His story is kind of cool, actually. He was a prisoner of war for a couple of years, and in those few years, he was exclusively fed potatoes, which, remember, only the lowest of the low would get to eat potatoes in the beginning. But after a couple of years, he noticed that um, he was still alive. And not just that, he was actually feeling quite all right. Being a smart guy, he figured out the potato probably had something to do with that. And he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to promoting the potato as a new source of nutrition because he was uh, convinced that it could solve quite a few problems. And he took his new job very seriously. He threw these lavish potato dinners for the celebrity influencers of the day. He even convinced the king and queen to wear potato flowers as fashion accessories accessories. And allegedly, he also did this thing where he would let people steal potatoes from a heavily guarded farm. I've done quite a lot of research on all of this, and I've come to the conclusion that this marketing stunt story, it is not more than that, just a good story, even if it did actually happen somewhere. Actually, the fact that versions of this story exist in so many different countries is the big hint here. What really changed peasants' attitudes towards the potato is just the sheer number of different scholars and food activists, really, all across the continent, like Eva Ekeblad from Sweden, just to name a woman, for example, who figured out the benefits of the crop and consistently promoted it for decades. Pair that with a good old famine, or little ice age even, in which, of course, due to the lack of food, people are quite adventurous in trying new things, and there you have it. Within just half a century, the potato in Europe became just what it used to be for the Inca, a food staple. And for a good while, it looked like thanks to this new super productive staple, the hunger that was so commonplace in Europe for centuries might finally have come to an end. But once again, things were not as easy as you'd hope. The potato was about to change a lot of people's lives once again. And I'll tell you all about it after a quick word from this video's sponsor, Boxu. Boxu is a monthly subscription service that delivers premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings straight from Japan to your door. Each Boxu features a new theme, providing a gourmet journey through Japan every month. Let's see what they sent this time. Just look at that. This is the theme of the month, Spring Otozure. Obviously, Boxu is trying to get me in the right mood for springtime, and I'm here for it. But let's check out these snacks. You know, I opened quite a few boxes already, and this is always my favorite moment. But now let's actually try something. How about this? Looks like potato chips, but I don't have to guess because this booklet that Boxu sends every time, it tells you all you need to know about each of these snacks, what's in them, who made them even. You see, I was right. These are potato chips with wasabi flavor made by an artisanal company with a 33 year history. But now let's actually try these wasabi potato chips. Oh! Mmm, this is really delicious. It's unlike any other potato chip I've ever had. It's so light and crisp, and the wasabi flavor is not overpowering. If you enjoy good snacks as much as I do, and you want to have your own Japanese snack celebration, possibly with your friends, then be sure to head over to the link in my video description and use code ANDONG15 to get 15 bucks off your first Boxu order. That's the link in the video description and ANDONG15 for 15 bucks off. Thank you, Boxu, for sponsoring this video. The successful rise of the potato was nothing short of a true game changer, maybe even too much so. By the end of the 18th century, almost a quarter of all Europeans were living off potatoes alone. But at that point, we had already entered the age of globalization, and a food revolution like that can simply not happen in a vacuum. And now we're starting to get into why I think the potato has truly changed the world unlike any other crop. First of all, the potato-induced population boom in Europe gave rise to the guano industry. What is guano, you might ask? Well, it is basically South American bird poop, but it also happened to be an extremely potent fertilizer. So not only was that the birth of input-intensive industrial farming the way we know it today, uh, but of course also big wars were fought over guano, which in turn was used to grow more potatoes. So 
But wait for it, here's the irony. Because one day in the early 1840s, a ship with a big ass pile of guano arrived in Europe. But on that ship, there was also something else. A barrel with, you know, a couple of potatoes from a cool new variety somebody discovered. But unfortunately, and of course, unbeknownst to the merchants who brought it over, those potatoes were infected with a terrible plant disease called this. Can't pronounce it, but this. In the common tongue, it's also known as potato blight. And oh boy, I could make a video on that alone. But to keep it short, this potato disease spread incredibly fast. It destroyed about a decade's worth of potato harvest and completely upended people's lives once again. Hundreds of thousands of people starved to death on the European mainland. But the place that was hit hardest by potato blight was Ireland, which was a British colony back in the day. Remember how I mentioned before that the Irish were among the very first to embrace the potato before all other European countries? Well, let's just say it really caught on and Ireland's population basically doubled within just a few decades. But also by the time potato blight reached the island, about 40%, almost half the people were eating potatoes exclusively, like nothing else. So as you can imagine, the consequences were catastrophic. In what is just known as the Great Famine to the Irish, about 1 million people died. Which I know already sounds like a lot, but in relation to the Irish population back in the day, that is the biggest famine in human history. About 2 million more Irish, basically anyone who could afford it, fled the country, mostly to the United States, in hopes of a better life or at least some food on the table. This is actually why Ireland, to this day, is the only European country that now has less people living in it than 150 years ago. So this European potato blight nightmare only really ended when more blight resistant new potato varieties were introduced. But not before, people had actually figured out that you could also kill the disease with chemicals. So basically, the potato is not just responsible for the birth of the fertilizer industry, it is also responsible for the birth of the pesticide industry. Both of which, I'm just gonna say, still pretty relevant today. So you can tell the humble potato is already leaving some not so humble marks on world history. But we haven't even mentioned the one thing that I believe is the biggest thing here. In that one decade where Europeans were all suffering from the effects of potato blight, Czechia, Austria, Poland, Italy, Germany, Denmark, Serbia, Romania, Ireland, and many more countries in Europe were all going through major political upheavals. Coincidence? I really don't think so. More like Europeans got real hangry. But that's just warm up. Let's get to what I believe is the biggest impact the potato had on geopolitics. So you might have noticed that this video is pretty Eurocentric. Europe, 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 right? But of course, it's not the only place it was eaten. For example, at the Chinese imperial court, it was known as a delicacy as early as the Ming dynasty. It also became an integral part of many African and Indian cuisines, and it is to this day. But sadly, a big, big force behind the tubers' global conquest were the colonial ambitions of its biggest fanboys, namely Europeans. And this is why I kept this video Eurocentric. Europe's population basically doubled in the 150 years following the popularization of the potato. And depending on your point of view, you could say this was perfect timing. Because one thing that happened alongside this whole potato saga was the Industrial Revolution. It's like what coal was to the ever hungry furnaces of those new factories that kept popping up all over Europe. The potato was just that, only that it filled the ever hungry stomachs of the masses that were behind the industrial revolution itself. And with these two things coming together, Europe's armies and fleets were getting stronger and stronger and it's rich and powerful, greedier and greedier. This is just my interpretation, but I believe that the world order we came to know that dominated at least the 19th and 20th centuries, you know, with a rich West dividing the world into pieces for its countries to dominate, a deeply imbalanced world order that now in the 21st century we're paying a very high price to correct, without the potato, I don't think it could ever have been possible. So next time you're having fries or mashed potatoes or whatever, don't take them for granted. Instead, just think about the fact that what you're eating right there is the one crop that changed the world more than any other.